and let me introduce now Nina Jensen, who is the CEO of uh, RevOcean, one of the, what I would say, and I, I labelled this session philanthropy as you've never seen it before, because quite honestly, I think it's one of the biggest philanthropic ocean projects that has ever happened. I'm not sure if it really is, but I, in my mind, it's like a huge effort that um, is ongoing with RevOcean in building the vessel, the centre and the data particularly. So, Nina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, as you're all probably aware, there is nothing more important to us than the ocean. Uh, the ocean provides us with more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. It regulates our climate. It provides an essential food source for billions of people all over the world. And it provides hundreds of millions of jobs. Many of us also believe that the solutions to many of the uh, societal cha challenges that we're facing today lie in the ocean. But at the same time, we are treating them as a massive waste dump. We are rapidly filling up our oceans with CO2, with pollution, and with plastics. And it begs the question, why on earth are we doing this, given their importance? Only in my lifetime, uh, our lifetime, we have actually lost more than 40% of life in the ocean and it's not looking to change uh, in the positive direction anytime soon. We have too many boats chasing too little fish. As I said, we are filling up the ocean with plastics uh, to the stage where, at this point in time, there is no single part of the ocean, no single beach, uh, no uh, ocean depths that are not littered with uh, plastics today. And the same goes for pollution. Runoff from agriculture and other human practices are increasingly filling up the ocean with pollution and causing dramatic dead zones and deoxygenated uh, areas, having massive impacts on uh, wildlife. And then I haven't even started talking about the impacts of climate change and the CO2 uptake in the ocean causing acidification that uh, Craig mentioned in his talk. All of these things are dramatic. It will have an impact not just on the marine life, but also on us humans and the future uh, food supply and, uh, and security. So um, I think also in essence, um, the ocean provides the mere basis for all the other sustainable development goals that are decorating uh, the arena here today. But you will not be able to achieve any of the other sustainable development goals unless you really take care of life in the ocean, life on land, and of course, climate uh, security. As such, uh, for me as a marine biologist and conservationist, it is uh, truly a great pleasure to be able to team up with um, many would call him a capitalist, uh, industrialist, a Norwegian billionaire, Kjell Ingeröke, uh, who I totally agree with you, is probably now the biggest ocean philanthropist uh, in the world. And we have one um, relatively simple purpose, to save life in the ocean and to make the ocean healthy again. And we have so far launched um, three what I would call game-changing initiatives to uh, achieve that. And I want to just go briefly through uh, the three of them. It started with uh, building the world's largest and most advanced research and expedition vessel. This uh, ship will be uh, 182 meters in length, jam-packed with the most state-of-the-art uh, technology and equipment to date and will be offered as a free platform to scientists from all over the world. The only thing that we ask in advance uh, in return is that uh, the scientist and the other uh, invited guests on board actually create solutions to the ocean problems. There's a lot of things that we know about the ocean. There's also a lot of things that we don't know. But what we really need is to focus on the solutions. So that will be the sole purpose of this vessel. 
Uh, as I said, it will be jam-packed with state-of-the-art equipment. It will have helicopters, submarines, ROVs, AUVs, uh, large laboratory uh, facilities. It will have uh, an incinerator on board that can burn up to three tons of plastic per day, and we can take samples down to 6,000 meters uh, of depth. Um, the ship will be sailing on all uh, seas of the world and will set sail in 2021. So if you have an exciting solution or research project, uh, please watch this space and send us an application to become uh, part of the cruise plan. Then our second initiative, which has sparked a bit of controversy here in Norway, uh, is what we call the World Ocean Headquarters. In essence, it's an ocean solutions hub, and it's the land-based version of the uh, REV vessel, where we want to bring together uh, a whole suite of different uh, stakeholders, ranging from NGOs, uh, corporations, uh, lawyers, um, finance people, uh, decision makers, under the same roof, once again, to be able to create the much needed solutions to the ocean problems. And we think that by actually combining different uh, forces, people with very different backgrounds, different mindsets, different capacities, this is where the magic will happen. Because a lot of times, uh, or up until today, uh, it's been um, conservationists like myself uh, talking to other conservationists or uh, bankers talking to bankers, uh, I think by combining these different skill sets, we will probably and hopefully be able to find some new and groundbreaking solutions. The only thing that we know at this stage is that the World Ocean Headquarters will be built. Uh, we haven't decided where. Uh, we originally planned for it to be located uh, here in Norway at Fornebu, uh, but the municipality turned us down because they didn't like uh, the architecture. Uh, we, however, are more focused on the content of the building and will be working on this over the next few months before we decide on uh, the final location. But this will be uh, a building jam-packed with uh, ocean activities in all aspects of the building, from the hotel and conference facilities to the uh, space that we will be offering to ocean-related uh, businesses and to the one-third of the building that Mr. schilling is covering the cost for himself and will be offered uh, once again free to scientists, NGOs, entrepreneurs, and others that really don't have the capacity or ability to pay for themselves, but that we still want to invite and include as part of the building. So this will be an exciting time going forward. Um, the third and final initiative is probably the most important one. As I mentioned, there are, there is tons of information about the ocean out there. But it is either locked inside somebody's head, sitting in great reports, uh, or locked away in um, individual databases. What we want to do with the ocean data platform uh, is to combine all of these different uh, points of knowledge, the different databases, uh, the different uh, research reports, combine all the knowledge in one place and disseminate it in new and meaningful ways to businesses, to scientists, to NGOs, to decision makers, so that we are actually making the decisions based on the right facts and not just the nice facts. Um, this will be a very complicated endeavor, uh, no doubt. Others have tried before and failed. Uh, but I feel confident that we will uh, succeed uh, because we have uh, the right people on board to do so. Uh, we're setting up a governance uh, body as we speak to manage the data, and we will offer this once again for free to people uh, from all over the world to make the right decisions when it comes to the ocean. The thing that is also interesting about what we're trying to do here is there is so much data uh, about uh, the ocean, but we have very limited capabilities as humans to actually understand the different interactions of these data. 
So by using uh, different forms of algorithms and machine learning, we actually want to make better understanding of the data that we already have and also understand what data is much needed to be able to solve uh, the major ocean problems. These were the three uh, initiatives that I wanted to present to you today. Uh, in addition, uh, last week we actually launched uh, another foundation uh, that we've called uh, the Plastic Revolution, which uh, uh, is aiming to solve uh, the plastic problem by establishing um, circular economy and waste management facilities. So we will start in Ghana uh, with a plant that will convert plastics to fuel. And hopefully when we succeed in Ghana, we will uh, replicate this model and establish similar waste management facilities in the countries around the world that need it the most. If you think uh, what we're doing is exciting, if you want to partner with us, if you want to provide your solutions as part of what we're doing, then please do feel free to reach out, of, out to us. We will not achieve in saving life in the ocean on our own. This has to be done in partnerships, which means that goal 17 of the SDGs partnerships is probably the most essential, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. I know there are a lot of questions that we can talk about around the, those three pillars of the, of the project that you don't, but I, I just wanted to focus on the idea that you ended there on the whole need for collaboration with other organizations and with other experts and the breadth of people. How do you see that actually materializing? Because when it comes to the data, I've heard, I mean, even NOAA is already collecting some data. There's a lot of, and you mentioned, there's a lot of other efforts to collect data already. Mm. How are you going to succeed where others have failed there? When it comes to building the, uh, the building, you know, you've already hit one hurdle with the local council who said, we don't like the look of that one. Uh, you might have to go and build it somewhere else or mm. change how it's looking. So when it comes to collaboration, Obviously, you've got to, obviously, it, with the building, change your objectives slightly. Well, not objectives, but change how it's going to look. With the data, you've got to look at how others have been building up the data before and how it can be used. And NOAA's data may not be the same kind of data as something from an institution in the UK, mm. for example. He's probably got his in Fahrenheit. The UK's probably got theirs in centigrade, mm. something like that. You know, simple differences there when you look at collaboration. So when you start building up these three projects, how are you going to ensure that the collaboration is truly effective so that everybody benefits, so you're all on the same page? You all effectively speak the same scientific collaborative language. Mm. Well, uh, it's an extremely important point, and obviously you're touching on some of the key challenges that we will be facing, in particular with uh, the data platform. So making sure that we're comparing apples to apples and not mixing in mm. uh, different kinds of data is essential, which is why this governing body of the uh, Ocean Data Platform Foundation is essential. And of course, once again, teaming up with uh, the NOAAs, OECD, and other relevant institutions that have a lot of the data, have a lot of knowledge about how to manage the data, and also how to combine it in a meaningful way. Uh, up until now, we've partnered with all the major uh, Norwegian scientific uh, institutions, and part of uh, these agreements is obviously how to make the data platform successful, and also how to interact with the data that they are uh, generating. Uh, and we have similar partnerships with uh, UN uh, Environment, with WWF, and a whole suite of them in the pipeline to be launched over the next couple of months. And as I mentioned, the only way to succeed is to work with uh, and through partners. Uh, and I think that is what will help us uh, achieve the success also with the data platform. And part of the reason why I think others have failed is because they maybe didn't have the necessary stamina, uh, mm. the necessary funding, uh, and also the right setup for what they were trying to do. We will be, uh, or the data platform will be an independent foundation. We have access to funding, and we have the right partners on board. It doesn't mean that we will succeed, but we're definitely starting on off uh, on the right foot. I noticed with the, with the vessel, you've got um, a strategy where organizations will be paying to use that platform 
where you've got the building organisations will be paying to utilise the, the office space in that building. And when it comes to the data, it's going to be for free. How can you turn that into a self-reliant or sustainable business model? Mm. Or are you going to use the revenues from the other two to make sure that that data is al always free and available? Or is there going to be any economic well, I mean, that's part of what we will be looking into over the next uh, six months. Obviously, uh, even though uh, Schellingeröcke has uh, a lot of money, it's not an endless uh, stream of, of cash. So we need to find a revenue model that works uh, over time. Um, the reason why we've set it up as a foundation is, of course, so that uh, uh, any revenue that we are able to generate as part of this venture will be fueled back into building more user cases, building the data platform further, and to further ocean conservation. Good, Nina Jensen, thank you very much for coming here today. Thank, thank you very much.